Hello there, fellow learners. You know, when it comes to expanding your knowledge and diving deeper into fascinating topics, nothing beats today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Looking to learn something new every day? Well, Brilliant will give you the skills that you need to unlock your full potential. Seriously, Brilliant has been my go-to resource for expanding my knowledge and taking my understanding to the next level. Brilliant is the ultimate interactive platform where you can learn maths, computer science, and so much more. They've got thousands of lessons from foundational to advanced topics with new ones added monthly. I just discovered a great course called Quantum Computing, a truly mind-bending journey into the world of quantum mechanics and the revolutionary potential of quantum computers. It's a must-try and it's kind of scary. Brilliant's visual, hands-on approach takes complex concepts and breaks them down into bite-sized lessons. It's like having your own personal learning coach right at your fingertips. Whether you're on your phone, tablet, or computer, Brilliant lets you learn anywhere anytime. You can even master a whole topic in as little as 15 minutes a day. It's designed for busy people. Look, you can try everything Brilliant has to offer for 30 days absolutely free. Just visit brilliant.org forward slash brain food or click the link in the description below. And guess what? And the first 200 of you will get an incredible 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So what are you waiting for? Go ahead and challenge yourself to learn something new every day with Brilliant.org. You won't regret it. Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring. And now today's video. By the winter of 1944 and 1945, the German Third Reich was in dire straits. Adolf Hitler's final offensive in the Ardennes had failed. The Soviet Red Army was driving ever closer to Germany's borders, and day and night, Allied bomber aircraft were pummeling German cities into smoking rubble. With the end in sight, the Nazi government hastily assembled a desperate last-ditch force to fight the final battle for the fatherland, the Volkssturm, a citizens' militia comprised of young boys and old men. Poorly trained and armed with motley assortment of leftover weapons, Volk Volkstrian units were derisively nicknamed casseroles by the regular army as if they were full of old meat and green vegetables. A little more than cannon fodder against the better armed and trained allied forces, the Volkssturm was emblematic of the suicidal fanaticism that typified the dying days of the Third Reich. But the madness went even further, for the youth of Germany were not only expected to face off against Russian tanks on the streets of Berlin, but shoot down waves of American bombers using crude wooden fighter jets. This is the story of the Heinkel HE 162 Volksjager, Nazi Germany's last ditch fighter designed to be flown by children. As the Allied bombing offensive over Germany intensified throughout 1943 and 1945, Nazi planners turned to a series of increasingly sophisticated wonder weapons in a desperate attempt to stem the tide. These weapons included guided surface-to-air missiles like the Messerschmitt Enzian and Henschel Schmetterling, jet fighters like the Messerschmitt Me-262 Schwalbe, and rocket fighters like the Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet. However, not only were these weapons resource-intensive to produce in the large quantities needed, but most could only be flown by experience experienced pilot, something that Germany had in short supply. So, on September 10th, 1944, the Reich Air Ministry, or RLM, put out a call for the development of a lightweight emergency fighter. According to the RLM specifications, the aircraft had to be powered by a single BMW 003 turbojet engine, weigh under two metric tons, use a minimum of strategic materials like steel and aluminium, and be easy to mass produce. Minimum performance was set at 750 kilometers per hour, or 466 miles per hour, top speed with a takeoff roll of no more than 500 meters and a flight endurance of at least 30 minutes. Armament was to be two 20 mm cannons with 100 rounds per gun or two 30 mm cannons with 50 rounds per gun. Most crucially, however, the aircraft had to be easy to fly with minimal training, allowing members of the Hitler Youth to fly it into combat. Proposals were to be submitted no later than September the 20th and the winning entry ready to enter production by New Year's 1945. This ambitious and foolhardy program soon became known as the Volksjager, the people's fighter. The Volksjager program was vehemently opposed by leading figures in the German Luftwaffe, including General Lieutenant Adolf Galland, who feared that it would divert resources from more promising aircraft like the ME-262. This view was also shared by many in the German aviation industry, such as engineers Willy Messerschmitt and Kurt Tank. However, since the project had the support of Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering and Minister of Armaments Albert Speer, both high-ranking figures in the Nazi government, these objections were ignored. Nearly every aircraft manufacturer in Germany submitted a proposal for the Volksjager program, but only two made RLM's shortlist. 
Blom and Voss and Heinkel. Blom and Voss's proposal, the P211, was remarkably advanced for its time, with a fuselage-mounted engine reminiscent of post-war jet fighters like the American F-86 Sabre and the Soviet MiG-21. The initial design even included swept-back wings for extra speed, though for ease of production, these were soon changed to simpler straight wings. Unfortunately for Blom and Voss, however, Heinkel had already been working on a lightweight fighter for some time. In July 1944, Siegfried Gunther, head of Heinkel's project office, issued a report to his senior managers, summarizing the state of German air forces and the ideal design requirements for fighter aircraft going forward. In addition to numerical ratios, the attainment air superiority also depends on flight performance. If enemy jet single-seaters are encountered, the superiority of the ME-262 cannot be relied upon due to its conventional design with unswept wings and the arrangement of the motor near the ground, which makes fuel consumption high and the range short. For this reason, it is necessary to limit yourself to a single-seater aircraft with the least possible equipment and the largest proportion of fuel in the total weight. The aircraft design became known as the P-1073 Stahljager, and it was calculated to have a maximum speed of 1,010 km per hour and a maximum range of 1,000 km using Heinkel's own HES-11 turbojet. But when the RLM issued its Volksjager specifications on September the 10th, Heinkel quickly adopted the P-1073 design to use the specified BMW-003 engine and submit Submitted it to the competition the following day. Thanks to this head start, as well as a measure of political lobbying, Heinkel ultimately won the competition and signed a contract with RLM to deliver 1,000 Volksjagers by April of 1945 and 2,000 by May. The design was officially designated the HE-162 Spatz, or Sparrow, though many sources incorrectly refer to the aircraft as the Salamander, actually a codename for its wing structure. Designed by Siegfried Gunther and Karl Schwalzler, the HE-162 was a radical-looking aircraft. It's the single jet engine was mounted in a streamlined pod above the fuselage, with the intake just above and behind the pilot's head. This, along with the aircraft's short tricycle landing gear, was intended to provide easy access to the engine for maintenance, a useful feature since the service life of early jet engines was measured in hours. While the fuselage was made of metal to conserve strategic materials, the short wings and tail, chosen to clear the engine exhaust, were built of laminated wood. Further, as bailing out conventionally was likely to result in the pilot being sucked into the engine intake, the HE-162 was among the first combat aircraft to be fitted with an ejection seat, which launched the pilot clear of the cockpit using a small explosive cartridge. Two versions of the aircraft were initially planned. The HE-162A1 bomber destroyer, armed with two 30mm MK-108 cannons, and the HE-162A2S superiority fighter, armed with two 20mm MG-151s. That said, the recoil of the MK-108s proved too powerful for the tiny airframe, so ultimately the MG-151s were used instead. Heinkel also came up with a number of follow-up models, including the HE-162A3, with a strengthened nose to take the recoil of the MK-108s. The HE-162 163B1 with a more powerful engine and greater endurance, the HE-162S tandem seat glider for training Hitler youth pilots, and a number of variants powered by simpler and cheaper pulse jet engines. However, due to lack of time and resources, only the basic A1 model was ever mass-produced. Incredibly, just 74 days passed between Heinkel accepting the RLM contract on September the 23rd and the HE-162 prototype's test flight on December the 6th. This took place at Schwechat Airfield near Vienna, with Heinkel test pilot Gotthold Peter at the controls. At first, all went well, until 20 minutes into the flight, a landing gear door fell off, forcing Peter to land immediately. The failure was soon traced to a faulty glue bond, a problem that would plague the aircraft throughout its short career. Nonetheless, the test was deemed a success, with the HE-162 reaching an impressive top speed of 840 km per hour, 520 miles per hour, at an altitude of 6,000 meters or about 20,000 feet. However, it quickly became apparent that the Nazi government's plans to crew the Volksjager with Hitler Youth was a fanatical pipe dream. While extremely fast and highly maneuverable, the HE-162 proved tricky even for an experienced pilot like Peter to handle, exhibiting significant lateral instability. And even bigger problems appeared four days later. as Got old Peter took to the air to demonstrate the HE-162 before Nazi Party officials. While making a high-speed pass over the airfield, the wing came partly unglued and shed an aileron, sending the aircraft crashing to the ground and killing Peter instantly. Despite this setback, production of the HE-162 carried on as planned. Indeed, such was the Nazis' desperation to get the Volksjager into combat as soon as possible that mass production began even before the first prototype had flown, with modifications derived from the flight testing program being applied directly on the assembly line. Among these were the strengthening of the wing structure and the addition of turned-down wingtips to correct some of the aircraft's lateral stability problems. 
While the first 31 HE-162s were produced at the Heinkel plant in Vienna, the ongoing Allied bombing campaign forced Heinkel to disperse production of components to small shops and factories all over Germany. Final assembly took place at the Heinkel plant in Merahenja, the Junkers plant at Bernberg and the underground Mitterwerk factory at Nordhausen in the Haas Mountains. Here, the aircraft were assembled by forced laborers from the Mittelbau-Dora concentration camp under the brutal watch of the SS. Incidentally, Mitterwerk also assembled the infamous V-2 ballistic missile, 3,000 of which would rain down on England and Belgium between September 1944 and March 1945, killing over 9,000 people. So this brings us to February of 1945, when the Luftwaffe formed a Pro Bungskommando 162, an evaluation unit commanded by Ober's Lieutenant Heinz Barr, an experienced fighter pilot with 200 confirmed kills. Based at Reichland Airfield in southern Germany, the unit received the first batch of 46 HE-162s and spent the next two months familiarizing themselves with the aircraft's handling characteristics. Meanwhile, the first operation unit, HE-162 unit, Jag Desfreder 1, was formed at Parshim, near the Heinkel factory at Mariena. However, as preliminary flight testing had indicated, the HE-162 proved tricky to fly, especially on takeoff and landing, leading to many accidents. As pilot Harold Bauer later recalled, When we started out in February and March, it was a very tough, cold winter at the time, and they had plowed runways with ice banks forming at the sides. During my short period at Heinkel Works from December 44 to March 45, we started out with 65 people, and when I took off on my last flight, there were five left of the original group. None of them died in combat, all of them died either by breaking out on landing or breaking out on takeoff, hitting the ice on either side of the runway. And then a sweeper truck came in and swept the remains into a big hole. Things didn't exactly improve when on April the 7th, 1945, just as JG-1 was approaching combat readiness, Partrim Airfield was bombed by American B-17 Flying Fortress aircraft, forcing the unit to move to nearby Ludwigslust airfield. A week later, they moved again to Lech in Schleswig-Holstein, near the Danish border, where the HE-162 finally saw combat for the first time. On April 19th, the type scored its first victory when an HE-162 of JG-1 shot down a British Hawker Tempest fighter. However, the German pilot was soon shot down himself by another Tempest while returning to base. The following day, another HE-162 pilot performed one of the first successful combat ejections in history. While his reason for bailing out is not recorded, given the HE-162's half-hour endurance, it's likely that he simply ran out of fuel. Indeed, while HE-162 pilots managed to score a handful of victories before the end of the war, this came at the cost of 13 aircraft and 10 pilots, most being lost to landing or takeoff accidents and engine failures. Fast forward to early May, shortly after Adolf Hitler managed to take out Hitler in Berlin, a Pro Bungs Commando 162 was formed into an operational unit under the command of Adolf Galland. But this was too little too late. For a week later, Germany surrendered, and Galland's men burned their aircraft to prevent them falling into enemy hands. Other units, however, gladly handed over their mounts, giving Allied pilots and engineers examples so they could evaluate the strange little jet. Thankfully, the Nazi Party's mad scheme to send swarms of Hitler Youth pilots against the might of the Allied Air Force never came to pass. If it had, it's likely that accidents and mechanical failures would have killed most of these boy warriors before they ever even saw the enemy.